Good morning. Uh, we're going to continue on in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, last time we were together, we talked about verses 11 through 14, where we talked about, spent a lot of time actually on uh, not being unequally yoked together with unbelievers uh, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness and uh, communion, uh, with, or communion with light and darkness. And that's a big chunk. But what we're going to talk about now is is kind of going to kind of flesh that out, fill that out a little bit. I I hope um, just open in a word of prayer, Father God. We're thankful for this time. We pray that uh, your word would be uh, clear and concise and spoken plainly, and that not my words would be what is important, but your words in the Scripture. And we just pray for your blessing on on everything we do this and during this time in your name, Amen. So we, we, like I said, we talked about the being unequally yoked. And as a teenager, I'll be completely honest, I kind of hated hearing that. But it was given to me by pious, well-meaning people. Um, so we talked, I'm going to kind of fill in a little bit. Well, we talked about um, being unequally yoked and, and the, the uh, example of a farmer plowing a field. We talked about light in the Bible being used as a word picture for right relationship with God. And there's a reason, a good reason, God separates light and darkness. Uh, in, in verse 15, we went on to see that uh, the phrase, what accord has Christ with Belial? And Paul's kind of bringing it home here, and it's a little bit of review, that it's used here as the name of Satan, being we can't, we can't be engaged in a relationship with Jesus and be engaged with the relationship with Satan at the same time. And the word itself, Belial, which is kind of an Old Testament word and kind of means a few different things. It really translates to wicked uh, and refers to a, a worthless or lawless person. Uh, and we talked about being concerned between the melding together of Christianity and politics and the kind of uneasy relationship the church has created with the world. But the reason that this is important is that we are told to come out among the world and be separate. And we kind of went through verses, uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 17, 1 Peter 2, 9, 2 Corinthians 7, 1, and Romans 12, 2, to kind of hit those points home. Um, it's good to remember something very powerful, though, and de deceptively simple. And this, I want to spend a little time on this going forward. God inhabits the lives and the spirits of his people. And we can go over this quickly and we can go, oh, that, that's, that's really nice. But what that means is that when we enter into a relationship with God, we become temples of the living God. And again, we can just, you know, go right past that and it sounds really nice. Verse 16 says, And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. This is, uh, he's quoting here from uh, Leviticus or the, the Old, Ten, uh, Old Testament, talking about the people of Israel. But Paul is telling this that, that this applies to us now. But it, it's an absolute reality. It's not an abstract idea that God is present in the life of his people. And that's something we need to, to hold on to. It's, it's not like we're carrying forward a, a a group of beliefs like a Buddhist person or, or a Hindu person. It's we have a relationship with the living God. And as being in that relationship, what we are is temples. He lives inside us. We could spend a lot of time just on this statement alone, but this is the same God who created the heavens and the earth and was chosen to reside. He's chosen to reside with us, his humble and very imperfect creation. The ones that truly respect God and obey him with willing hearts. And that's really what he wants. That's we've talked about. It's a theme that we've talked about. And it must be a theme in my life or I wouldn't talk about it so often. But what it is, is that God gave us Jesus Christ as a way to bring us back into right relationship with him. Huge cost, huge expense shows what God's true desire is to have relationship with his creation. 
and he wants us to be the ones that have willing hearts. Uh, those like, again, those words where we, in verse 16, he says, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God. And as I mentioned, it came from Leviticus and it actually comes from Leviticus 26, which, you know, Leviticus is an interesting book to read. It's not, it's, uh, it's not a, like a, read like a great novel. It's a, it's a lot of rules. But when you understand the rules that God's people lived under and you see what Christ did to, to, to complete that law, it's an amazing thing that was done, but at an amazing cost. Um, so in Leviticus 26, he's saying that he will place his home among the people, and that was his home, the temple, and that he would walk amongst them. He said he'd be their God and they would be his people. And this is very significant. This is important. Most of the Corinthian Christians were not from Israel. That God had joined them in, and we hear that phrase many times if you've ever heard a sermon. But God grafted us in with to the to His loyal people from Israel. So the promise was for them as well as as far as grafted in as well as it was for for God's chosen people, Israel. He implies that in His people, in whom He lives, are holy people. So take a look at verses uh, seventeen and eighteen. And this kind of gets to be wrapping up this chapter. Therefore, he says in verse 7, Paul writes in verse 17, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean. And we'll talk a little more about that. And I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Some very impactful, very important things here. Isaiah 52 um, Verses 7 through 10 says that God will comfort his people from Israel. He will rescue them from the nations that have treated them horribly. And here we see Paul echoing this. People who are given a holy task, as we are, must behave in a holy manner. And none of us are perfect, and none of us are going to be perfectly holy, but it is the condition of our hearts that we seek after holiness is what's important. In the Old Testament, God's people followed some very onerous rules. They couldn't even touch something that was unclean under the law. And if they did, they would be considered unclean for a prescribed period of time. Even basic bodily functions would cause someone to become unclean and there would be a certain time of, of uh, seclusion that would have to take place before that person would be considered clean again. Uh, as Christians, we thankfully don't have to follow these rules. Uh, we still need to aim for holiness, however. It is wrong to think or act or speak in a way done by those who do not have an accord with God. So what are we saying here? We're saying that if you're a Christian and if you've, ex you've accepted that, uh, and I, I guess the phrase I have used in the past that I'm maybe not 100% comfortable with is, if you've entered into that contract, that you have accepted Jesus Christ as your, as your personal Savior, and you're, you've entered that right relationship with God, we should be different than someone who has not experienced that, who has not entered that contract. Uh, we still, uh, we frankly still have to be uh, separate. We have to be called out. God wants us to separate ourselves by a few different ways and that's having right attitudes and how we conduct ourselves in our hearts minds and spirits finally we'll look at verse 18 and we see the reason that God's people must be different from other people and it's actually it's it's one of those verses you, you kind of skip by and you, you read it is one of those things as I was preparing uh, this class that I was reading my Bible at work and at lunchtime and, and I kind of read over it fast and went back to work and I started to be uncomfortable and I started to think about uh, verse, you know, actually verse 17 and, and verse 18 and how the more you think about it, the bigger it gets. In verse 18, and I'll, and I'll read it here quickly, it says, And I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters says the Lord Almighty. Uh, not only has God made us a family, 
He has said to us in this verse that he has chosen us to become members of his family. It says his own sons and daughters. And that's an honor to be sure. We're going through, passing through a time recently where I remember uh, the passing of my dad. My dad's birthday was recently. And even though he's been gone eight years or so, the relationship, it's, there's still a hole there. And as we record this, my father-in-law, who I've become close to, is uh, in California and is experiencing some severe health problems. And, and I, he's, a, he's a dad figure to me, you know? I had an uncle that passed many, many years ago, also a father figure to me. And to think about what it means to be a, a part of someone's family. And then this is God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, who's, who's saying to us as Christians that he wants to make us sons and daughters. That, that's an incredible thing. Um, as the Holy Spirit works in us, we, we move toward a more perfect relationship with God. And it really is a... It's a continuum. It's not that we're going to get more saved as time goes by. We can parse that out a different time. But when we ex accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and we become, we, we become saved and the process of atonement happens and we, we get closer and closer and our relationship with God becomes, it grows and grows and grows over time. It's God who is able to complete the work that he's begun in us, only God. It is this, and this is exactly what Paul was trying to say to the Corinthians. Next time, we'll, we'll go uh, continue a little bit the same train of thought into chapter 7. But, uh, um, and we'll talk about Paul's message of repentance to the people in Corinth. But what I would leave you with is this, is that we serve a God who wants us to be his children. That's an amazing thing. We live in a world right now that things are a little upside down, things are a little crazy, and there's opinions coming from 7,000 different directions, and many of them are wrong. And what we need to do is we need to trust in Jesus. We need to trust in God to discern what it is that we should be doing, what we should be believing, what we should be following, and what we should be obeying. We have this relationship with God the Father that He is desired to have with us. He's chosen us to be his children. And I think that's something that during these times and all times we need to lean on. So I'm looking forward to actually seeing you in person. I miss you all greatly, um, but we'll close on a brief word of prayer. God, we just pray, Lord, that your message, as it is spoken, gets through, that our, le our leaders, uh, the people that are around us every day, Lord, we pray that we would be called out, set apart, and that we would be a beacon to people who have not uh, entered that contract. And we pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would convict, that they would see the example, and that your Holy Spirit would convict and draw people into Jesus Christ. And we just thank you for this time we have together, this opportunity to talk about your word. And, and Lord, we just pray for blessing everybody who's listening. And we just pray you bless this church and the congregation and and anybody who might listen, and that we would turn to you in a difficult time. We ask it in your name. Amen.